Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The death of Christ is the greatest victory the world has ever seen. Through it has come God's triumph over sin, over death, and even the devil himself. But if we are honest with ourselves, it doesn't really look like much of a victory. It kind of looks like a defeat. And it certainly seemed that way to everyone at the time. The disciples are gone and in hiding in fear. The women stand by and watch helplessly. The only ones who seem to be in control of anything at all are those who are doing the crucifying. So how can it be that this is actually victory? What does it mean for us that it is? In many ways, I think that the world we live in looks more like Good Friday than the Sunday of the resurrection. By all accounts, the church these days is on its heels, if not fleeing to the hills and mountains. There was a time not so long ago, which many of you can probably remember, when the people of God seemed to enjoy sway over the society in which they lived. It was almost self-evident that the things of God were good for mankind. Many strived to bring forth the fruits of faith in their lives and didn't want to be cast back into darkness. At least that's the way how it is remembered. But those are just memories now. An evil has fallen upon our world that seems to pervade the hearts and the minds of all. It is as if we have returned to a world without the gospel. A world ruled by the barbarisms of old. Everyone looks to themselves to do what is right in their own eyes. We are a people who have become ruled by the lusts and vices of our heart does not matter how much pain and agony it brings into our lives, the people of this age just march on toward their own destruction. And we are seemingly helpless to stop the advance of this sort of unholy trinity of the flesh and the world and the devil. It can be discouraging to watch it all unfold before us. We know it will only lead to the temporal ruin of the people of this land, and to their eternal condemnation. And yet, despite all this, the darkness does not love the light. Give them hope in the things of God, and they will mock you for it. Show that mercy and compassion of Jesus, and they will call you weak. Ours is the age of the return to violence. It is the age of the powerful and the strong, just like it was at the time of Jesus. But such times are not the times to lose heart. Our Father in heaven above chose the right time, the appointed time for the Christ to come into the world. He chose an age of great unbelief, of vices that would even make the people of our time blush. And he did so to demonstrate the power of the gospel even in the darkest of ages. It is in the fullness of time that the Christ enters the world. The Father sent his Son to do only what God could. He was to manifest the light and life of God in the world and thereby bring hope to fallen mankind. And Jesus did this well. He taught the word of God and its truth and purity. He had compassion on the weak and lowly And for all these things, he was to be crucified. It's a strange thing that it is the cross which reveals the wrath of God. Because in many ways, what the Father has appointed the Christ to do is submit to the wrath of the world. It was the disciples who abandoned Jesus. It was sinful priests who had him falsely accused. And the crowd that demanded his blood. It was Pilate who could have released him, but he was too afraid of the mob. 
It was immoral soldiers who nearly flogged him to death and paraded him in kingly clothing like a human trophy. He was crucified by the will of Jerusalem that his place should be made to hang among criminals. Even the strangers who passed by mocked and jeered him. It was the world that killed the Son of God. Our Heavenly Father didn't need to manifest the Christ in the world and strike him down with the divine wrath of heaven. All he had to do was hand him over to us. We see in the death of Jesus what is in the hearts of all mankind. Lies, betrayal, murder. The world and those trapped in darkness look at the death of Jesus these days and they see nothing more than what they believe to be fables from days of old. But it's a picture of what is in their hearts that they should actually see. The world trying to kill God is what is really there. And that is the same world we still live in. We may long for better times, but as long as we are in this body of flesh, all we're going to get is a world that is bloodthirsty for God. And as it once came for our Lord, so too will it come for us. Such is the way it was then, and such it is now. But this our Heavenly Father knew. And it is exactly why he chose such a time as the fullness of time to reveal the love of God in Christ Jesus. Our Lord was not sent to condemn the world. He didn't need to do that because it stood condemned already. We stood condemned. He came into the world that he might show the world what it is missing. He came to show them the love of God. That was the purpose for which Jesus had come. That he might not destroy the world, but save it. Man had brought death into the world, and it is this that the Christ had come to conquer. But in order to conquer death, Jesus needed to demonstrate that it had no power over him. That he would not fear it, nor be held captive to it. And in the wisdom of God, this meant that Jesus would undergo it. What better way to show that something has no power over you than to submit to it without complaint? But some things are easier to take up than others. And the cross which Jesus bears with the sins of the world upon his shoulders is a burden that only God could carry. In order to demonstrate that God desires to love the world and not destroy it, Jesus allowed himself to be destroyed by the world and the cross he was forced to carry. He allowed himself to receive the worst suffering that mankind has to offer, even though he himself didn't do anything to deserve it. Yet he bears that burden not for his sake, but for our. It is for our sins that he is stricken. Yet like a lamb, he goes to the slaughter, because in fact, he is the lamb. And as he hangs on the tree, he does so alone. There is no comfort that the world affords. There is no request that he might live. For Jesus, there is only suffering and death. But this too is pleasing to our Lord. Not that death and suffering should reign in the world, but that they should be undone. As he dies hanging cursed upon the tree, little does the world know that its victory in the killing of the Son of God is actually its undoing. For you see, there's something that, is, that happens when he gives up his spirit that many probably thought little of at the time. It happens when the soldiers come to verify that Jesus has in fact died. They stab him in the side. And what comes forth is blood and water. It's what the soldiers were expecting to see. 
But little do they know what it truly means. That blood and water is a sign of things to come. Because that blood and water isn't just any blood and water. It is the blood and water of the very Son of God. What pours out of Jesus is the redemptive price of the world. It is the fulfillment of God's promise in the beginning that should there be sin, then there must also be death. Christ has given his life into the hands of sinners so that we sinners do not have to be given unto the wrath of God. Thus the price of our sins is paid in his blood and peace with God once more is made. But it is not just the blood that flows forth from Christ. It is also water. For Christ is the water of life. It reminds us that the atonement he has made in his body is extended to us in our baptism. It is there where blood and water meet that the righteous life of Christ becomes our own. And the sins of our flesh are given to him. As that blood and water flow forth from Christ, it points to the reality of where the people of God will be washed and cleansed from their sins in the blood of Jesus. Also that they might appear before the throne of God robed in his righteousness. That blood and water thus become the church's blood and water by baptism. Your blood and water by baptism. So what at first looks like defeat is the very source of victory. Christ's death is not the end, but the beginning. Because the grave cannot hold the one from whom this blood and water pour forth. Death shall have no power over him. And for all those in him, it shall have no power over them either. Which means it has no power over you. And if death has no power over Christ, and if death is to have no power over you, of what then shall you as the people of God be afraid? Shall the advancement of all sin and vice in the world make you tremble? Shall the struggles of the church make your hearts quake with fear or the tribulation of your lives cause you to lose hope? Such are the desires of the devil. But he has no power over you. Only the appearance of it. The devil and the world are already defeated. They just don't know it yet. But you do. And as the baptized, you are to press on. Because the empty tomb awaits. And in the end, final glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.